Today, the headlines rang out. Pfizer shot is far less effective in 5 to 11 year olds than in older kids. New data show. And on NPR, Pfizer vaccine protection against COVID quickly wanes in kids aged 5 to 11, study says. The first was the New York Times. So there's a new preprint out. It's by the good folks at the New York Public Health Department. And it's about the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine in this younger age group. And it is looking at the vaccine effectiveness, which is how well is the vaccine performing in the real world. Now we have to remember, of course, that the mRNA construct that's within that vaccine is for the ancestral strain of COVID-19. It's not for Omicron. It's a different sequence in there than the current strain. And that's led a lot of commenters, Michael Carrillo from the NIH, myself, many others, to wonder how good is it going to be against the Omicron variant. And we've seen already preprint after preprint after preprint showing reduced vaccine effectiveness. And you also see in real life because we all know people who are having breakthrough infections. And that goes hand in hand, part and parcel with diminished vaccine effectiveness. This is the New York State Report, and it's looking at that 12 to 17-year-old age group and the 5 to 11. Now, the other salient thing to talk about is that the dose is different. One is a 10-microgram dose every 21 days, and the other is a 30-microgram dose. So these kids are getting a smaller dose. But the primary endpoint of the study that justifies that is a non-inferior mean geometric antibody titer, and we all know that that's the gold standard, or so we're told, and that's what led to EUA authorization in this group. But this is the real world outcomes. This is what many of us, myself included, with Wes Pegden and Steph Burrell argued that you really needed to set the primary endpoint as some type of disease state that you want to avert. It should be something severe. That's what the primary endpoint of the study should have been, not just antibody titers. But here we get the vaccine effectiveness against any symptomatic breakthrough. And the answer is, oh, it's not good. It is down. Let me see. Let me give you the exact numbers. Among children newly fully vaccinated, Vaccine effectiveness against cases two weeks after vaccination for children 5 to 11 was 65%. But when you pushed it out 28 to 34 days, it dropped to 12%. 12% vaccine effectiveness 28 to 34 days. That's very low. That's a low percentage effectiveness. That's so low that had that been the efficacy in the original Pfizer vaccine trial, the product would not have received EUA because the FDA said that they wanted a point estimate above 50%. And so it is 12%. That is very, very low. Um, hospitalizations. Now, some of the news coverage is saying, well, it still protects against hospitalizations well. But I believe if you strictly read the article, that would be a bit incorrect because, of course, vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization had a confidence interval that spans the null. It is a wide confidence interval and we cannot exclude no effect. It's actually huge. It is, I'll try to find it. No, that's not the hospitalization. It is quite broad. What's my point here? There are just not enough cases to know with confidence that it prevents hospitalizations. And in fact, you'll need a bigger data set to do that. That's in part a good thing because hospitalizations are so rare in this group, but it is not statistically significant. It doesn't cross one. So I think it would be a mistake to conclude or infer from these data that you have proven that. We have not proven that. And that's still an open question. So what does this mean? And of course, in the higher age group, it's a little bit better. But there are a number of differences between the higher age group. One is that they are older the other is, and by being older, they may have different test patterns. They may not be seeking testing at the same level of symptoms. So that's a salient difference. Another difference is that they got the vaccine shots a long time ago, hundreds of days ago, rather than 50 days, which is what the 5 to 11 year olds got it. Um, the other difference is that they got a long time ago and people have had maybe breakthroughs along the way. And so you're really kind of asking the question among the people who have not yet had breakthroughs. And so that I think is another salient difference, but they do an analysis of the 11 year old cohort and the 12 year old cohort. And that's sort of what we call a regression discontinuity design just above and below the cutoff. And they show that the 11 year olds have much lower vaccine effectiveness than the 12 year olds, which would argue that it's not about the testing patterns because these guys should be about the same. It's really about the dose. Um, but I would say that I'm still a little bit nervous about drawing that conclusion because I'm not sure that they have enough power to really see that difference and they might be anchoring to potentially a bit of noise, statistical noise in those two bins. So I think we'll need to see more studies, but I do think it is a possible hypothesis and it is reasonable that there's something about the dose. The other hypothesis is that, you know, well, there's some other hypotheses, but I think I'll put that aside for now. What do I think are the more, most important takeaway points? Takeaway point number one, the vaccine effectiveness of the five to 11 year old age group is low. It's 12%. 
So this vaccine in that group will not make a sizable dent in pandemic transmission dynamics. These kids who are vaccinated or not vaccinated, they're both very, very susceptible to getting a symptomatic COVID-19 outbreak. The next point I would make is the good news. They are both vaccinated or unvaccinated, have a very low likelihood of having bad outcomes. This study suggests that the point estimate might favor in terms of averting bad outcomes, vaccination. However, the confidence interval is wide, and so we should not draw that as a firm conclusion yet. It is different than the older age group. It appears to be lower. I think it has implications for policy immediately. Number one, I think, and um, I think a prerequisite for vaccine passports, you know, stories about museums throwing out kids if they haven't had a booster or, you know, the vaccine mandate to go to a museum or vaccine mandates in New York City. These are uh, a prerequisite to even have that is high vaccine effectiveness. That's gone. So I think that there is no scientific case to even have it. That sets aside the fact, is there a moral case to have it? And is there a political case to have it? I think those were always not there. I think it was a bad idea to begin with. But here, I think it's clear, it does not separate kids who can spread this virus from kids who don't. In fact, it has a very marginal difference in the rates with which a kid is susceptible to symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. The next corollary, mandates to go to school would be illogical, borderline delusional that you would take a vaccine with a vaccine effectiveness of 12% and mandate it, and at the penalty of not complying, you'll throw a child out of school. That would be perhaps the worst policy you could ever imagine. It would be a policy that harms many, many kids, much more likely to harm uh, black and Hispanic kids because those racial groups have lower vaccine uptake than white and Asian kids, and much more likely to harm kids who are further down on the socioeconomic ladder, precisely the kids you don't want to harm. You don't want to throw those kids out of school. You don't want a policy that actually furthers racism, which would be a structurally racist policy. And yet we hear the appetite for this. And I think uh, I'm very concerned about that. The other thing I would say is that there were many of us who were very cautious, Michael Carrillo at the meeting, that, you know, do we really want to move forward with a mass vaccination campaign with an older ancestral strain when multiple companies, Pfizer and Moderna, are developing a new vac- Omicron-specific strain and we can see what that does. And uh, I think to some degree, those critics have been vindicated. That's exactly what happened. I think uh, that's a problem. I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this is a huge finding. And this shows, I mean, above all else, that, you know, we've been just stuck between two extreme poles of anti-vax and anti-anti-vax, two irrational poles. And the anti-anti-vax poll believes they have the moral superiority here. But the truth is, anyone who understands evidence understands there was always a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot we didn't know. We saw the dwindling vaccine effectiveness in the face of Omicron. That should have given us pause. We should be very cautious about how we counsel people about these products. These authors are quick to say that they still recommend vaccination. I think that's, what they, that's how they conclude their data. Um, they also think it's part of a, quote, layered approach. I think that's one interpretation. Other countries globally have different interpretations. I think Swede, Sweden has not moved forward with vaccinating this age group. I think they may feel vindicated by that choice. I think they also have been very reluctant and walked back testing this group. They don't want test positive results to paralyze schools. And so I think that's the Nordic attitude towards this. Northern Europe has a very different attitude than America. Um, but these results are incredibly notable. That level of vaccine effectiveness is very, very low. It's 12%. I mean, that is a low level of vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease. That means that segregating people based on vaccine status in that age group, 5 to 11, would be unjust. Having different quarantine rules for 5 to 11-year-olds, this is a point that Waleed Jalad from Pittsburgh made online, that would be borderline delusional and unjust. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to have different quarantine rules. Um, We should be very careful about not applying coercive pressure to families to do this. We shouldn't let parents get fewer days of quarantine if they decide to do it. We shouldn't have rules at public spaces to mandate this. We shouldn't be checking kids' vaccine cards. I think those would all be misguided when this is the level of vaccine effectiveness you have. doesn't mean they can't do better. Perhaps the next version of the vaccine might do better. But for now, I think it does require a very nuanced conversation and an individual conversation with people. But the answer is, you know, it's low. I don't know what to say. It is low. And uh, let's see what it says about hospitalization. Uh, Here we go. Pressure on higher 
loss position with IRR. R. Confidence intervals are so wide. For 5 to 11 year olds, protection against hospitalization, vaccine effectiveness 48%. The confidence interval goes from minus 12 to 75. So it crosses one. It's really very, very wide. I mean, that doesn't give you a lot of certainty. But that's in part good news because there are just very few cases in that cohort. Um, I don't know what to think. I think that this is real news. This is important. Um, this is. You know, we're talking about, I'm looking at the raw counts. In December, you know, week by week, we're talking about zero, two, three, five, six, eight, eight hospitalizations. You know, that they're very low, and, and that's why. They just don't have the power to find the difference. Um, but that's good news, I think, and that's that's good news. And so I think this has to be an individual choice. It has to be a personalized decision. People should be counseled that the vaccine effectiveness with time dwindles. Um, ah, the last point, the last point, the most important point. I have an article out in City Journal. I have an article out in City Journal. I'm going to put it right here on the screen. And that article is about the FDA's fiasco from six months to four years old, where they got everyone very excited about having an EUA in that age group, only to walk it back at the last minute. Why did they get excited? Well, the trial had failed to meet the non-inferior antibody titers, which is the primary endpoint, but they saw some difference in cases in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2, and they thought it favored the vaccine arm, and they wanted to approve it based on a secondary endpoint, symptomatic cases, and I had always warned that they're looking at the data many, many times. You don't know how many times they're looking at the data. And that undermines the credibility of a secondary analysis. And ultimately, according to Scott Gottlieb on Face the Nation, they didn't have enough signal there. And they walked it back. And they never showed you the data. They took it away. And they got everyone excited. And then they took away the, the plan. And they got all these op-eds angry with them for not approving it anyway. When you have a drug vaccine product in 5 to 11 that did meet, that did meet the antibody threshold you pre-specified, and you have vaccine effectiveness of 12%, what do you think? What do you think was going to happen if you push that other one through that didn't meet, that didn't meet that antibody threshold, that's dose is 3, not 10, not 30, but 3 micrograms? What do you think would have happened to that product? The vaccine effectiveness, I don't know. But it might have been quite low in the setting of Omicron. It might have been very low indeed. And so if the American public had been exposed to a product that was very controversial like that, with a very, very low vaccine effectiveness, you could imagine that would poison trust. Many, many months ago, Steph Brawl, West Pegna, and I wrote an article in the British Medical Journal, and we argued that the pathway emergency use authorization is meant for, you know, a true emergency, a catastrophic situation, and that truly does apply for SARS-CoV-2 in older ages. But when you have that sort of steep, gradient of risk and you get to the younger ages, we struggled to believe that that was a suitable regulatory path and we wanted to have other regulatory paths. Now, I think some poor faith commenters thought we said we were against or for the vaccine. We're not against or for anything. There was no data to be against or for. What we were for was a certain regulatory standard. Um, that's what we were for. And I think that article has aged quite well. It's actually as relevant today as it ever was. And a lot of the things in there are very salient in light of this new information. The New York Times, NPR are covering it. This is a preprint out from the New York State. It has implications for mandates, for passports, for that whole fiasco of six to four-year-old. I wrote that whole op-ed in City Journal. It's out today. I'll have put the link down below that walks you through that narrative. That was a bad day for the FDA. And all of this is all happening. Why is this happening? Two people in the FDA resigned, Marion Gruber and Phil Kraus. They were two people with a lot of experience. I have to think that this wouldn't have been the way things played out had they been there. They were the ones who pushed to expand the sample size of 5 to 11. They were the ones who were cautious about boosting adolescents without more data. They were sound people. They're people who have been in the agency a long time and they think very critically about vaccine products. They're no longer in the agency. And what you have, and the reason they left, according to many news accounts, is that they felt pressure from White House to approve boosters. You have the heavy hand of White House on FDA in this space. How much of a role did that play here? How much of a role did that play with that botched six-month to four-year-old decision? I don't know for sure, but I suspect historians and, and reporters will find out more information there. But I don't think that's good. You need a completely unfettered FDA, an FDA free to do whatever they think is best. And if not, you may end up in a situation where very soon after the product launch of a novel vaccine in a very young age group, you have vaccine effectiveness at 12%, which is not going to make a lot of people happy. It's going to make a lot of people angry.
I think there's going to be a lot of parents whose kids have breakthroughs anyway. There's going to be a lot of policies that are done because people think that they'll somehow curtail or curb spread in the in the in the setting, but it does no such thing because this line, vaccinated and not vaccinated, has a very modest difference in the propensity for someone to get sick. And uh, I think uh, mandates would be very foolish now. And uh, this is uh, incredibly noteworthy news. Incredibly noteworthy news. Obviously, there are other things in the news, so it's going to take a back burner backseat to that but okay if you like this video this is what you get on this channel you get the analysis of i think regulatory products policy covid19 mostly cancer and cancer drugs too we're going to go back to a little bit um through the lens of somebody who spends a lot of time doing meta research in this space studying regulatory approvals and history of fda and written a couple books relevant to the topic so like subscribe comment leave a message below and uh until next time.